The following episode contains difficult subject matter. Please take care while listening. I'm Kathleen Goldhar. This is Crime Story. Every week, a new crime with the storyteller who knows it best. In Chicago tonight, a group of teenagers is charged with beating a black boy to a pulp and then boasting that they kept their neighborhood white. Leonard Clark is still in a coma. Police say he was attacked by a group of white teenagers who used racial epithets as they beat him unconscious. On the first hot day of March 1997, 13-year-old Leonard Clark was out for a bike ride with his friend when they were attacked for being in the wrong neighborhood. I learned that the lead attacker was uh, the son of a, of a powerful uh, mob boss. A mob boss with ties literally dating back to Capone. When Johannes Lecour first heard about this attack, he was a 23-year-old man from the south side of Chicago. And the case pushed him to become a journalist and to look deep into what happened to Leonard. He ended up breaking stories on how the mob and racial politics affected the investigation. And now, 25 years later, Johans tells the entire story in one of my favorite podcasts of all time, the powerful and riveting You Didn't See Nothing. Johans Liqueur, welcome to Crime Story. It's a real pleasure to have you. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is exciting. Thanks for having me. So take me back to Chicago in 1997. What was going on in your life? I was a part-time student at University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, I was uh, selling weed in the neighborhood and, you know, across the south side. I was living with my father. I was also starting to write plays. So I was figuring it out. Um, I I knew I didn't want to be like a full-time drug dealer, but that's how I was feeding myself, um, and I was pursuing my own, like, creative interests. Uh, created a theater company with my best friend Earl. We were writing plays at the time, and I'm just kind of throwing stuff at the wall, trying to see what, what lands and what's comfortable. Not exactly a typical 24-year-old. I wasn't starting theater companies and writing plays at 24. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of my friends weren't either. I, I, looking back, my experience wasn't a typical one. So let's jump into the story you told. Tell me, who is Leonard Clark? Leonard Clark, in 97, he's a 13-year-old boy, I guess relatively nondescript. He was from the project, still kind of young, not yet um, too attuned, it seemed, to to, uh, to, like street life, right? He was still an innocent kid. He's, you know, that innocent, he hadn't been lost yet. And he, uh, one day, he and his little buddy, just wanted to go ride bikes and go play. And he and his friend went to play on their bikes. He catches a flat tire. Uh, Air in his neighborhood costs a quarter. You know, uh, we're talking about people at the bottom of, you know, the socioeconomic ladder. Um, And so that quarter, (laughs) he could have found better things to do with it, knowing that Air was free one neighborhood over across the expressway. That neighborhood was... Chicago's sundown town. That was Bridgeport, and that's where he was attacked. Tell me about Bridgeport. That expressway divide is more than physical. Yeah, so, you know, well, so one, just to give you some context, there's a history of, of redlining that is, you know, has just continued to haunt black Chicago because we don't own much land or property and, and weren't able to create land and home ownership. And so there was a time when there were only certain neighborhoods black folks could live in. They called them racial covenants, right? Black folks can only live in certain pockets of the city. And they they called it a black belt. Um, The red line was a line basically that separated the places black folks could live from the places that they couldn't by law. Um, Once that was, you know, outlawed and banned, a kind of de facto redlining took place where the projects and the way they were set up was like the new redlining. Um, it, was, it was almost like a legal loophole that, that you know, was obviously intentional, too. And so the, the expressway was built between 
Bridgeport and the project so as to separate these white folks in Bridgeport from these black folks in the projects. Um, so, yeah, Bridgeport was um, for a long time that very racist sundown place where black folks were still being attacked and beaten or worse, you know, simply for being black and caught out of bounds. And so what happens to Lennart? He and his uh he and his buddy had uh, gone to get air for their tire and they wound up playing a game of pickup football with some Mexican kids in the area. And as they were leaving, uh they were spotted by some Bridgeport young men who decided that they wanted to uh to attack them for being black in their neighborhood, who decided they had no business being over there. And uh, and Lennar Clark was beaten into a coma and left for dead at 13. And, you know, fortunately for his friend, he got out of there with, you know, with just, I think they, they landed a couple blows, but he was able to get away, and the crowd focused on Lennard, who ran in another direction, um, and, and Lennard took the entire beating. And how did the police get involved finally? Uh, well, the pe- police were called. There was a witness. There was a guy uh, named Jeff Gordon who lived in Bridgeport but wasn't from Bridgeport. He had only been there a short time. So he wasn't one of these Bridgeport racists. He was a transplant. He was from somewhere else and just found a place to stay in that area. And thank God for him, right, because who knows if and when the police get called uh, it, had it not been for him, had it been up to just, you know, regular average Bridgeport residents. But it was his experience that gave you the name of the podcast, right? Can you tell me what he hears? He's called the police. They show up. By this time, there's a huge crowd of Bridgeport residents, right? And and um, there was a lot of excitement. Everybody comes out. The police show up. And as the police are asking Jeff Gordon what happened, men from the rest of the crowd, Bridgeport residents, are saying some Mexicans did it. And so they're basically just trying to blame someone else. I mean, it's kind of a perfect example of dumb racism. We'll just, we'll blame Mexicans, you know what I mean? Because they could have, you know, you could have mistaken them for white folks. We'll blame Mexicans for it. Um, Obviously, they weren't going to blame black folks for it because, you know, everybody knows black folks ain't over there. Um, If they are, they end up like Lennar Clark often. You know, this Bridgeport man was given this, you know, this this false narrative of what happened. Jeff Gordon stood up and was vocal, like, no, no, that's that's not what happened. And then someone from the crowd shouts, you didn't see nothing in a threatening manner, in a way to let them know you, you didn't see nothing. Shut up. Everybody out there understood that that was a threat, that that was like, you know, shut your mouth. And so, uh, and so yeah, once it was time to come up with a title, it just made all the sense in the world. You didn't see nothing. Audio podcast. Every, you know, it was maybe a quadruple entendre. It just, it fit. It was great. Thank you. As an aside, I thought it was perfect. The media, though, did really cover the beating, um, both locally and nationally. There was a lot of news about it. What was the public reaction? Outrage. And, 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 you know, when it first happened, everybody was outraged. I mean, because, you know, yeah, it was it was uh, like as biased and racist as local media may have been. You know, the, the beating of this little 13 year old boy in Bridgeport. It says so many things about Chicago. And, you know, it, I, I think most people with any kind of humanity were outraged by it. So there was a lot of a lot of protest. Uh, the media jumped on it swiftly and it went to uh to national heights and president clinton then president clinton was on his weekly address talking about it it was a huge thing just last week in chicago a 13 year old boy riding his bike home from a basketball game was brutally attacked and almost beaten to death apparently for no other reason but the color of his skin and, it, and during these days, when the media first jumped on it, those early days, he was still in the coma. And people were unsure if this kid would even make it. Was this going to be a tale of a youngster murdered in Bridgeport? 
or just, you know, damaged for life. How did you respond? I responded by wanting to um, react with violence. I, I, uh, when I, when I heard about it, I was outraged too, and so I, I called my buddies. I called my friends who I would call to fight fire with fire if, if fire had been set upon me or mine. And so, and so we went to Bridgeport. We piled in my buddies' little car and uh, rolled over to Bridgeport with some bats and some pipes or whatever and. And we reacted really emotionally, like we forgot where we were going or what we were up against. As we got there, we were reminded quickly, like, wait a minute, like, first of all, we stand out like sore thumbs, it's Bridgeport, and we, like, sorely outnumbered. You know, the five or six of us that fit in that car was, you know, we got chased out of there pretty quickly. And your dad, though, told you to do something differently, right? Your dad plays a pretty important role at this point. Yeah, he does. Um, like I told you, I had started writing plays. I had done some writing for other smaller publications and, you know, smaller stories here and there. And I had, I had been writing since I was a kid in some shape, form, or fashion. And so that's when he said, look, write. Write about it. Um, and he just happened to have come across uh, an ad for a freelance journalist for a local newspaper that also came from out of the projects called the South Street Journal. And uh, they were paying twenty five dollars an article, and I, you know, I would have done it for free. And so, yeah, I found I found a South Street Journal. I met Ron Carter, the editor and publisher over there, who was just a phenomenal, who is just a phenomenal guy um, in the community and on the South Side. And he was able to like immediately put me in tune with uh, with Lenard's mother, even. And so I was I was thrown right into into that world. Um, and then began investigating and writing. I just want to stop and tell you one of my favorite parts of the podcast was when you debate the color of the car. I didn't have a driver's license at the time, so Earl, my playwriting partner, he drove me. He had this magenta Mercury Tracer. We used to call her Tracy. Yeah, so we pulled up at that spot. I never forget, in my red Tracer. It was future. We pulled up on that spot, and I'm like, they looking for you? That was such a lovely moment. <laughs> Yeah, Earl Earl didn't <laughs> didn't catch that at first listen. And some of his buddies called him like, "What's up with the with the fuchsia car? What are you talking about?" He didn't even he didn't even catch that. So we we, we laugh about it. I yeah, thought it was, was great. That was part of what I loved about the podcast is just every once in a while your friendship and humor came through. And sometimes at the nicest moments when everybody sort of needs a little bit of a break because you're just so immersed in this, like you said, it's a 13-year-old boy and you're feeling so sick and then... No, well, no, you know, I appreciate I appreciate you saying that a lot of people, you know, we, we've gotten um, feedback from folks who are like, uh, is it okay that I laughed so much? And it absolutely is. Life is so tough and it's so hard and it has been in so many ways that um, if you don't find some humor in something... It'll break you down. And so, yeah, yeah, we we have to find um, times to smile. It it makes me think. I was having this conversation recently um, with a good friend about just that, about that that dynamic of smiling and laughing in the midst of intense pain and oppression. And I was telling her, even when I was in prison, we laughed. We laughed hard. But we were in prison and wanted to get out of there like our lives depended on it, you know what I mean? Um, and it makes me think of the narrative that white folks started to come with about happy slaves. Mm. Because I'm sure, um, when I think about my experience in prison, when I think about my, my experience on the streets of Chicago, when I think about the experiences in Chicago that my buddies who you know were born and raised in the projects and have had it the worst, when I think about the laughter and the good times that people still you know um, had and took from that, you know, um, it makes me think of the fact that, yeah, during slavery, people laughed and joked. They had to. They couldn't have lived as long as they did. They, they it's, just, it's just something that if people can't understand it, they just haven't been in situations that perilous. But when that's then distorted, like, okay, they're laughing and they're smiling, so they like it. You know, to, to, to not be able to look at life with enough nuance and critical thought to understand how both can exist at the same time and 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 the laughter and smiles never indicates a pleasure um or an embrace of the situation 
It's just dealing with reality and, and finding a way to live through it. It's just humanity. Tell me what you learned about who his attackers were. I learned that uh, the lead attacker, the, 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 the young man who was driving the car and in- initiated the, the attack and first spotted Lennard and his friend, was uh, the son of a, of a powerful uh, mob boss. A mob boss with ties literally dating back to Capone. And that was just, that was a huge discovery for me. Capone was like this mythical level of Chicago mafia. I mean, it was, yeah, that was, that was huge for me. Like that made me realize that we, you know, I'm investigating something pretty serious here. Right. And, um, and then I, you know, came to find that the rest of the attackers, uh, were, were his buddies and one or two of them were likely to some degree uh also tied to the mob and 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 the same you know mafia that that this kid's father was a boss of i also learned that uh there were probably at least six attackers instead of the three that were accused and charged um, but yeah, the, the biggest find was was this young man's deep tie to to the mob through his father. And how did that affect the police investigation, the whole official investigation into what happened? You know, I was told that um, the lawyers for the for these young men were able to walk right into the police station and kind of kind of take over the police station in a way that never happened in a way that. No one was used to seeing lawyers walk in and take command of a police station before, so which which indicated, you know, a really strong connection between uh, this family, these families, and and that that police station, which was in Bridgeport. So we're talking about a neighborhood where a lot of these young men wind up becoming cops. And then what did that mean? How did that manifest in like witness statements and people coming forward and getting the case actually to the point where you can hand it off to a a prosecutor to do something? Right. So you got three Bridgeport, three young Bridgeport men in a car who roll up and spot Lennar Clark and his buddy. The lead attacker, Frankie Caruso Jr., from the Caruso family, he spots Lennar and Cleavan and says, you know, let's beat them up. Apparently, the two in the car, you know, didn't want to do it. He calls them pussies. He jumps out. He hits the street. And a group of, of you know, this is their neighborhood. And a group of other young men who they all knew see him running after these two black kids, you know, jump in the chase with him and beat the boy almost near lifeless. So when the two young men who were in the car who didn't jump out were interrogated, they spilled the beans. They told everything they knew. And they uh, incriminated the hell out of Frankie Caruso Jr. And so initially, uh, there was a there was a case here. There was a huge case here. You got two witnesses. Obviously, they didn't have time to put a story together. It was But their story synced up about how this guy jumps out of his truck and, and beats Lennar Clark damn near to death. Um, and I think that it was... Uh, shortly after that, that their families got involved and and started kind of to take control, um, and they started to move a lot, a lot more like a lot more like mobsters. And so you have w- would have witnesses, right, that would go missing, witnesses that changed what they said they saw, and then you have one who Michael Cutler, who yeah, he was murdered. So right, that yeah. was that's when stuff starts really looking like okay, the mob is involved here. I mean, you know, everyday Chicagoans start to realize, black and white, start to see what's going on. Once it's understood, you know, the family, and you know, what's going on here, who these people are, you got one witness who, who can't be found. You got another witness who has changed his entire story. And you got a third witness who's murdered. 
right? And um, and he's murdered in, in really strange circumstances. He's murdered on Chicago's west side, which is pretty much all black. And so, you know, this 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 white kid who turned out actually to be mixed, um, which was a huge discovery for us. But this kid who we didn't know was mixed at the time, right? So we're looking at it as a white kid from Bridgeport who ends up murdered on the west side of Chicago visiting a girl. Just made everybody scratch their heads. It was called a robbery by the police, but the only thing that was taken was a class ring, which a lot of folks who've known mob activity and have studied it say indicates a hit. You know, you take the ring to show you got him. It just it didn't make sense. But that's how the police handled the case, as if it were just a robbery. Um, dismissed any um, notion that it could have been related to this huge case of the summer that had gone national. You know, the judge suspected it was a hit. The judge in the case suspected it was a hit. You know, and, and all, damn near every, every black person reading this story was confident that it was a hit. And most white folks expressed the same thing, including journalists. So while it was clear that in a court of public opinion, you know, the mob was guilty of having murdered this boy to keep this other one out of prison, the police never made the connection. So it was never connected to the case and ultimately just left an unsolved murder. All of this is in your early reports. What impact did your investigation have at the time? At the time, my my investigation had very little impact, and it was super disappointing for me in a lot of ways. But I, I got a call. I'll never forget. I wound up getting a call from the mayor's office. It was a sister. It was a black woman who had told me that my name had come across their desk as a community member who had deep ties to the community, and they wanted to offer me a job. So it was obvious they heard it. It was obvious that that article reached them. And it was also obvious that it reached these Bridgeport Italians because they wound up paying a visit to uh, the South Street Journal office looking for me. This is all like movie-ish, right? Because everybody fits the description. You you know, you see it. Um, you know, if you, you know, you watch these tough looking Italian guys jump out of a mobbish looking car going into the South Street Journal office. And at the time, white folks would never be caught on that side of town. And so it automatically, like, they stuck out like sore thumbs like me and my buddies did when we went to Bridgeport for retaliation. So in that moment, it's like, well, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't get out the car, watch, long story short, they leave while I'm ducked down. I run upstairs. And so that just took this thing to a whole new level and and indicated you know, that much more how involved mafia-related folks probably were. So after the attack, the Caruso family started speaking out and saying that their son wasn't guilty. But at the same time, they also start going around to black churches in the neighborhood where they speak about racial healing and even develop a relationship with Leonard and his mother. Can you tell me more about this conversation of racial reconciliation that quickly took hold? So, yeah, a conversation about racial reconciliation was started. I don't have any faith that it was ever genuine. And it was concocted largely by this family, right? And and, and uh, The Caruso um, and, uh, family. The Caruso family, right. It's like, look, we got to keep this boy out of jail. Um, and, you know, the first thing we got to do is, like, let's get some attention off of this. Let's start to change um, how we're looking at this. Let's, start, let's frame it differently. And that's where racial reconciliation came through. And then you had a couple mealy mouth black folks who, you know, who who were already probably on the Caruso speed dial and, you know, um were made to felt like they owed them favors or something. They were already in bed with some with some black, you know, so called I call them so called leaders because they did have some, you know, some strong constituencies and followings and support in, in the south on the south side of Chicago. 
And, you know, they, they just they fell in line. And, and so they were pushing this narrative about, you know, um, racial reconciliation and healing, which, you know, which is just absurd um, to even suggest when you're talking about a beating that was so vicious of a boy that was so young by people who were claiming they were guilty. What are you reconciling? What, what are we healing from if you didn't do it? As a listener, just what I heard, too, along with all you're saying, is that all of a sudden the responsibility is being placed on the victim and his family and his community as opposed to the perpetrator. And it just happened so quickly, and there was no time to allow the victim, his family, and the community to even process the actual event because they were forced into a conversation or they tried to force them into a conversation about reconciliation, which as you said, is obviously was manipulated and politicized. Well, the victim and the family actually were just uh, the most exploited and manipulated, in my opinion, looking back. Um, Because one, the victim, Lenara Clark was in a coma and had to learn how to walk and talk again, right? So so, you know, him dealing with it and trying to come to some sort of grips and understanding, having time to it, it's definitely not even a thing. And his mother was already so vulnerable, having been burdened with a lot of the stresses of living in the ghetto, raising a child in the projects. She was in a particularly vulnerable situation that rendered her more easily manipulated and misled by this white family and their black henchmen, social henchmen, I'll call them. There's a part in the podcast we get a quick mention. When we asked other children in the projects what they thought about what happened to Lenara Clark, there were a lot of them that actually wished it would have happened to them so that they could have been removed from the projects because Lenar, Lenar Clark wound up and his family wound up being moved to a, a home outside of the projects, having a house uh, with wheelchair accessibility and, and all this type of stuff. And so, you know, just just the, the prospect of being moved out of the projects was so appealing that it made children wish that they'd been beaten into a coma, possibly near death, right? And so it doesn't take a whole lot to buy a victim's cooperation at a certain level. You know, if we have nothing and you can put some food on this table, it's going to start to mean a little bit more than, you know, this kid going to jail. I know this kid ain't going to take my son again, you know, so him going to jail is kind of inconsequential when we don't have food. You know, and so, um, so yeah, I think that uh, it was that was to me still the most tragic factor in this whole story is how that family was was handled and manipulated, and how they were already you know in such a uh, um, such a vulnerable state that that was even able to happen. You mentioned. Mealy mouth, social, I can't remember the word you used. Uh, henchman. Social henchman. Social, mealy mouth, social henchman. Tell me about Reverend Martin. <sighs> yeah, you know, um, mm, this is an interesting conversation for me. Um, uh, just because, um, tell you another story okay. real quick. I was online and there's a there's a white woman who who I'm um, like Facebook friends with or we follow each other on Instagram and um, really cool, cool lady. We met uh, through some leather work. And so she she saw the podcast and she got to talking about she got to talk about really badly about Jesse Jackson. And I felt a way about it. And I had to tell her that, you know, even as a white ally, you got to be careful about how poorly you speak about the black folks that even I ain't on the side of because it's just a hell of a dynamic. It's almost like if my cousin or brother has betrayed me, 
still my cousin and my brother, and, it's, and, and, and he's still a victim, and he's still operating like this because he is a victim of the same kind of racist manipulation, exploitative manipulation that I am. He's just too weak to to fight back in the same way. And so it just becomes a touchy situation. It can get emotional. It, gets, it can get hard to maintain a, a certain logical approach to it. So that's why I just um, cringe a little bit. But, you know, I've introduced this concept in these terms, so so it is what it is. I've, I just had to deal with that in, in, in real time myself. Reverend Martin, um, I would call him slippery. I would call him slick. Uh, I don't think anyone is all bad. I think Reverend Martin has probably had um, better intentions in his life and his work than what was demonstrated by his participation in his role in this whole fiasco. He was the reverend who apparently the Caruso's contacted as soon as they realized they needed to do kind of damage control with the community. They contact Martin. They'd already worked with Martin to some degree. They knew Reverend Martin already. Um, I believe that they were uh, a lot of them were in bed with these with these so-called black leaders uh, through the Caruso's union work. I believe that it was through the Caruso's involvement in the union and av- ability to kind of create and supply uh, labor work for black folks that the Reverend Martins of this case were able to kind of um, hand out, which is what put them in in communication in the first place. And so you know, Reverend Martin just starts running with this absurd, ludicrous, ridiculous narrative that it wasn't Frankie Caruso Jr., that it was somebody else starts to invoke how Jesus would want us to all get along and and how we should heal and no one wins from this animus and this hostility. Um which which questions like what what respect or regard do you have for this little boy and his family and any little boy that looks like him that may run up and find himself in the same circumstances. And so he he played a, a major part, and that helped to divide, you know, black folks, because he has a, a large constituency and congregation of black folks. And like a lot of spiritual followers tend to do, they bought a hook, line, and sinker. This is their spiritual leader. It doesn't get bigger than that. It doesn't get more powerful than that. And don't get me wrong, you know, um, I can't judge Herbert Martin. You know, I, I'm I'm not, you know, I, I come up in the tradition of Christianity myself. And so, you know, I don't I don't I live in a glass house. I can't throw stones. I've 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 done wrong. I've done things I'm not proud of. But it was just so so frustrating and disheartening to interview him twenty something years later. And watch him stand by those words and stand by those moves. It's, it, was, it, was, it was crazy. I appreciate the honesty with which you responded to the, my question. But I also really appreciated the honesty with which you tell the story in the podcast where you yourself explore your own internal contradictions about just those sort of things. I mean, that was a really amazing way for us to be brought into the story was through your own internal struggles. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it's through the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, that that was uh, that was something I didn't expect to deal with. We didn't expect to deal with. It was a woman named Perry Small who was um, worked at WVON. At one point, once she realized I had, I had gone to prison, she asked me what I was in prison for. And I told her I had, I had sold drugs. And she just very nonchalantly, quickly was, oh, okay, you, you sold out. But you did your time and you're back and you're here and you're doing good stuff with yourself. Let's move on, right? You've acknowledged it, right? And it hit me a little bit, right? And that was, it was at that moment once, we, you know, we're discussing sellouts. We're discussing that whole concept. And so, yeah, the fact that we're also discussing my trip to prison, my life as a drug dealer, and the fact that, you know, um... Somebody we had spoke to had had uh, suggested that I was a sellout. It was relevant, and and it it just it just made sense to to talk about because we were honestly um, trying to explore 
We weren't trying to just craft a narrative. We're honestly trying to explore what happened in that case, what happened with me, where are the through lines, where are the parallels, and it was just, you know, you, you can't really overlook that. It just stuck out like a sore thumb. Speaking of sellouts, you've been called one for what you did, what you think. I had to sit with that. And um, and a lot of people, that resonated, um, interestingly, with, with a lot of listeners. Um, and, and what I tell folks, and I, I'm not sure it came across on the podcast, is that I, I wind up accepting, acknowledging the fact that, yeah, when confronted with that question, did I sell out um, selling drugs, heroin in particular, to black folks? Um Knowing the struggle, understanding what black folks are already up against, yeah, I, I would deem that a sellout move. However, that's not to say that I think that every black man selling drugs in his community is selling out. I don't think it's that simple. I think that, you know, we are in a very unique situation. You talk about nuance, right? We're in a very unique situation where our access to legitimate routes of of building prosperity and wealth pales in comparison to our access uh, to drugs as a means of developing what looks like prosperity and wealth. And that is by design. For me, I'm selling out because I know better because I was raised in a different tradition, because I come from Panthers and civil rights activists. And I know how how much this was designed to stifle black liberation and black progress. Knowing that and understanding that and still selling drugs with the idea that I'll get money and get out and change a situation, I was selling out by doing that. Um, a lot of my buddies who never looked at life like that because they never understood life like that, because they were, you know, placed and started so far at the bottom. It wasn't selling out, it was survival. And that just speaks to just how tricky and complicated our position as as Black folks in America is. Well, I have to tell you, as a white woman from Canada listening, it came through and it was an experience and very worthwhile And I really appreciate everything that you guys put into this podcast. It was really important to listen to. Let's wrap up by, unfortunately, going back to the perpetrators. They finally do go to trial. Uh, Can you tell me what happens? What was the verdict? They go to trial. Charters only brought against three of the men uh, when there were likely at least six. And the, the the ringleader, Frankie Caruso Jr., the son of the, the, the mob boss, uh, he gets sentenced to like eight years. Uh, his case is appealed. He winds up doing less than two years. Uh, the other two who were accused with the with Michael Cutler, who was going to, you know, testify, uh, who had already agreed to testify and wasn't reneging with him out of the way, with him now dead, murdered and. Caruso Jr. having been convicted and these other two changing their story, the case against them had just become weak and they were offered probation. So they wound up never seeing um, any jail time for the conviction. And so all in all, for the assault of a 13-year-old boy that left him in a coma, left his life permanently changed. Uh, disrupted his family, took them through stress that continues to haunt them to this day. Uh, less than two years of jail time was served in in total. And it's just, uh, yeah, when I compare that to the stories, including myself, of black men going through the criminal justice system and the type of sentences we receive for the type of crimes we are found guilty of, I think it just kind of points to what we're dealing with in America. Did this project help clarify anything for you? Did it release anything for you? Or did it, you know, you've got now a bit of time from it being finished to being released, to being in the public, to getting a response. How has all of that sort of come back at you? Yeah, I, it's it's put a lot on my mind. So on a good note, right, I am uh, I'm re-energized 
and I feel a lot better about what can be done through journalism. We live in a in a different world now where it's not just three channels and a couple of newspapers that gets the word out to the masses. You got independent journalism organizations that are doing amazing work. You got social media, which allows for a lot of voices that, you know, are noise, but it also allows for voices like ours and, and the team of journalists that, that, you know, I've been introduced to. I have created really beautiful professional relationships and beautiful friendships with white allies that I hadn't known prior to this experience. So I see, I do see hope. I see more hope through journalism in particular. But, you know, going through all of it, talking to Reverend Martin 25 years later, you know, I'm also reminded of how much hasn't changed. A lot of this was was motivated, you know, and inspired by watching these um, violent assaults on black life go unpunished for the past 10, 15 years. And so... It's a lot that hasn't changed. And, and to, to be black in America is to be under constant attack. It is to be in a perpetual war. And so, um, you know, I'm reminded that that war is still intense. Uh, that battle is still going on. But I'm, I'm also encouraged by the fact that we got more weapons that, that we got to take advantage of and use. Well, this was wonderful talking to you. I so appreciate the time and the thoughtfulness you put into this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I, the opportunity just to, to share in a real way. Thank you. You've been listening to Crime Story from CBC Podcasts. Next week, I'll be talking to Michael Lista about the life and death of Dr. Elena Frick. I think if you want to understand what crime really means, it is about, especially a murder, it is about a human being being obliterated by another human being. It's like it's like a library being burned to the ground. That conversation is available now on CBC Podcasts' YouTube channel or for subscribers to CBC Podcasts' Apple True Crime channel. In addition to early access, subscribers to our True Crime channel also listen ad-free. Crime Story is written and hosted by me. Our producers are Alexis Green and Sarah Clayton. Sound design by Graham McDonald. Our senior producer is Jeff Turner. Our video producer is Evan Agard. Our YouTube producer is John Lee. Executive producers are Cecil Fernandez and Chris Oak. Tanya Springer is CBC Podcast Senior Manager, and Arf Narani is the director of CBC Podcasts. Mm-hmm.